Welcome back. In our second question for chapter 10, um, we got something that will definitely be very important for us and how we start to approach problems. And we'll see very soon why this is the case. But let's dive in. So the statement is, for the configuration in example 10.1, consider a rectangular box of length L, width W, and height H. Situated a distance D above the YZ plane in the diagram. A. Find the average energy in the box at time T1 equal equal D over C. Okay, so we have a distance over a speed. So meters canceling with meters per second leaves us seconds. Get used to seeing that. And T2 equal D plus H over C. Again, meter over meter per second gives us seconds, so we're good there unit-wise. In part B, we want to find a pointing vector and determine the energy per unit flow into the box during the interval be, uh, interval of T between T1 and T2. C, integrate the result from B from T1 to T2 and confirm the increase in energy, part A, equals the net influx. All right, so what is this box we're talking about? All right, well, thankfully we have a diagram. We see the bottom of the box is situated at height D away from the YZ plane, has a height H, a length L, and a width W. Pretty easy box there. But beware what's going to happen first in the time horizon. All right, so what we know about the example from 10.1 configuration is we have a scalar potential that is zero, and we have a vector potential that goes such as mu naught k over 4c, parentheses ct minus the absolute value x, parentheses close square in the z hat direction. Now, what this says here is that the absolute value of x has to be less than ct in order for there to exist anything. Because at absolute value, you have to take the plus case and the minus case. But so long as you have that, so long as x is within ct, you're good to go. So plus or minus if you had to break out that absolute value. So, you know, here K is just another constant. And C, the speed of light, is 1 over square root epsilon naught mu naught. We've seen that 100 times already in this book. But good to have it in mind. So then the fields are, well, if we take the negative time derivative of this uh, potential, or just the time derivative, excuse me. Um, no, is it negative? Let me double check. It is indeed negative, excuse me. So, yeah, we need to take the negative time derivative. And uh, as you see, when we do that, we get an extra factor of C. And that cancels out with what we see here. Um, instead of uh, mu naught k over 4C, we just get uh, 2C from the power rule and chain rule. And that cancels down. Now, uh, for the B field, we have to take the curl. And hence why we go from Z hat to Y hat. And again, we have plus or minus based on what uh, direction we're flowing from the perspective of x. So positive for x greater than 0 and negative for x less than 0. So for x outside of or any x value that is larger than c times t, both of the fields are 0 due to both potentials being 0. All right. First part of the setup, done. Now on to our solution. So we need to recall that the energy is given by W equal one half than the integral with E squared and B squared d tau with whatever multiple to make the units match. Since this is a piecewise defined configuration, we need to determine where the potentials and therefore the fields are actually defined. Okay, and here's where things get really tricky. And we just have to take our time. So at T1, uh, we have we were told in the question statement that that was D over C. So if we know what some distance is and we put the variable time in there, we want X over C is greater than or equal to T1 in order to exist. So we need X greater than C, T1. Therefore, A equals zero and E and B are zero. At T2, when we have the plus there and we have X put in there, we can see that X needs to be C, T2 minus H is less than C. And that's where we can be. Now, what this tells us is that we can use this x value to plug into the fields and actually plug the fields into the energy equation. So that's what we had to do to solve for x. Clearly, uh, x being greater than c2, c, uh, 
T1 means that our fields are zero, so we don't have to worry there. Now, with this, we can see in purple, everything condensing pretty nice. So, with that, uh, you know, once we plug in X equal what we have here, we're good to go. Um, anything else? Yeah, okay, so what we see now on B is that uh, because we have both of these terms squared, uh, we just look at the magnitude, and we see that we have E and B are pretty similar for the offset of the 1 over C. So what we say is that B squared is equal to 1 over C squared, E squared. So we only have to plug in one of these expressions, and we can simplify it through. This is great because now we have an expression that goes inside the integral of just 2 epsilon naught E naught, or epsilon naught E squared. Again, we'll see this tactic used again uh, very shortly in this chapter and next chapter for that fact. So, the energy in the box at time t equals 1 is, well, 0. We don't have any energy in there because the fields don't exist at that time. Um, within the box, anyways, based on the piecewise definition. However, for t2, we have uh, w of t2. Again, the 1 half needs to be taken care of with the 2 that we found from simplifying the field structure in the last slide. Again, our dimensions of the box go from 0 to L, 0 to H, or 0 to W, and then D to D plus H. And now we just plug in everything with the square, and we're good to go. Uh, looks like I cropped off that DZ on the end. Uh, so my apologies, but it's supposed to be DX, DY, DZ on the integral formation, but I think we're, at least we can piece that together. Anyways, Fubini's theorem coming through again after we square everything. Keep the X's with the X's, Y's with the W's, Z's with the L. And uh, mu squared over mu squared k squared over four just comes on out, not a problem. Um, and then you will see if we let u equal d plus h minus x, du is equal to negative dx. We plug in the bounds, plug in the bounds, and you see we get an inverted bounds, which is okay since we have a minus sign. We can reflip them and evaluate them, and we uh, get this epsilon naught mu naught squared k squared l w h cubed over twelve as a result. Um, you don't really need to do the u sub, but it helps. Uh, you can use any number of calculators online. Now for part b, uh, s of x, well, we got to find a pointing vector, which is the cross product of e and b. But recall that we saw how the field b looked like a 1 over c times e, so that's what we plug in here. And voila, we get the... Um, uh, we get a E squared again, except we have a mu naught and a C and a minus plus that we have to deal with. But what this shows us is that we have a Z hat cross Y hat, which is much easier to deal with. And if we plug in what the E squared was, we got a lot of couple cancellations here, not a lot. Uh, but we have a minus X hat, and we'll see here that that switches to plus or minus that we plugged in when we plugged in plus or minus for the B field. Um, but yeah, nothing too spooky with the pointing vector. I think we got our hands pretty good with that in the uh, chapter 8. So again, here, plus for x greater than 0, and as is the case here, and for uh, the absolute value x greater than s of t, s times t, the pointing vector is 0 since we don't have any fields there. Similar stuff. So the energy per unit time entering the box in the time interval is, well, power of course we need to have dw dt is equal to p which we know p is equal to the pointing vector at d times da so plug it in and we'll see what we have there in the box mu k squared lw over 4c times ct minus d squared now note that no energy flows out the top since d plus since s of d plus h equals zero all right so that leaves us finally with c w from T1 to T2 of PDT, well, we have a whole lot of constants there, and we're only left with CT minus D squared DT. We plug in what the bounds for T1 and T2 actually work as in their givens. And then you see we get a cube term there, and we go ahead and plug it through. We see uh, if we express this in terms of Cs, the speed of light, then we have the first expression, but if we plug in the uh the fact that 1 over c squared equal epsilon naught mu naught, we get epsilon naught mu naught squared k squared l w h cubed over 12, which is exactly what we had in part A. Wow. As messy as this could be in a setup, and as long as I've drawn this out, this really isn't too bad, and the fact that these things relate 
or at least our equivalent, shows very good or very well that we're on the right path. And we'll see more of this again soon.